we start this lecture with an overview, a plan for what will be presented. In this pre-lecture, we will conclude our discussion of collisions and look at the energy of a system of particles in more detail. In particular, we will start by developing a useful relation between the relative velocities that must hold in an elastic collision. We will then look at the details of the collision process and introduce the concept of the impulse that describes the change in momentum of one of the objects in a collision. Finally, we will investigate the kinetic energy of a system of particles and will find that the total kinetic energy can be expressed as the sum of the kinetic energy of the center of mass and the kinetic energy of the particles relative to the center of mass. Last time we discovered that the description of collisions is often simplified when viewed in the center of mass reference frame. In particular, we showed that the speed of an object before and after an elastic collision is the same when viewed in this frame, even though its direction will be changed. We will now use this result to obtain a relation between relative speeds in a collision that will hold in all reference frames. In particular, since the speed of an object before and after an elastic collision is the same if viewed in the center of mass frame, then it is also true that the relative speed of the two objects is the same before and after the collision in this frame. That is, the rate at which two objects approach each other before an elastic collision is the same as the rate at which they separate afterward. We can now use this result to identify elastic collisions in any inertial reference frame. Namely, the relative velocity of two objects at a given time, that is, the difference in the velocity vectors of the objects, must be the same in all inertial reference frames. This claim follows from the fact that to transform both velocity vectors to a different inertial frame, we simply add the same vector the relative velocity vector for the two frames, to each initial velocity vector. This relative velocity vector, then, cancels when we take the difference of the velocities of the objects. Now, if the relative velocity of two objects at a given time is the same in all inertial reference frames, then the relative speed of the two objects must also be the same in all inertial reference frames. Since we've just shown that the relative speed of the two objects in an elastic collision is the same before and after the collision in the center of mass frame, then it follows that the relative speed of the two objects in an elastic collision is the same before and after in any inertial reference frame. Indeed, if we look back to the one-dimensional example from last time, we see that the relative speeds of the two objects, that is the difference in the magnitudes of their velocities, is equal to 5 meters per second both before and after the collision in both the center of mass and the lab reference frames. We just showed that in an elastic collision between two objects, the rate at which the objects approach each other before the collision is the same as the rate at which they separate after the collision, and that this statement is true in all inertial reference frames. For example, here we see a ball thrown against the wall of a building. If the wall is hard and solid and the ball is made of good hard rubber, then the collision will be almost elastic and we expect the speed of the ball to be about the same before and after it bounces off the wall. Here we see a bowling ball moving with speed v colliding head-on with a ping-pong ball that is initially at rest. If we assume the collision to be elastic and the motion to be constrained in one dimension, what will be the final velocities of the balls? How do we go about solving this problem? Well, we just learned that if the collision is elastic, the speed of the ping-pong ball relative to the bowling ball must be the same after the collision as it was before the collision. Before the collision, the speed of the ping-pong ball relative to the bowling ball was just equal to v. Therefore, the speed of the ping-pong ball relative to the bowling ball after the collision must also be equal to v. Now, since the bowling ball is much heavier than the ping-pong ball, we expect its velocity will not change much during the collision. Therefore, we expect the final speed of the ping-pong ball to be about twice the initial speed of the bowling ball. 
as a check, we can look at the exact solution which we obtained last time and we see that in the limit that m1 is much greater than m2, we recover our approximate solution, that the speed of the ping pong ball after the collision is about twice the speed of the bowling ball. In applying conservation of momentum to collisions between two objects, we have been concerned only with the velocities of the objects before and after the collision. We now want to investigate exactly what Newton's laws can tell us about the details of the collision process itself. We start with the differential form of Newton's second law, which relates the total force on an object to the time rate of change of its momentum. We can rewrite this expression to determine that the change in the momentum of an object during a small time dt is just equal to the total force acting on the object multiplied by this time interval. If we now integrate this expression over the time of the collision itself, we see that the total change in the momentum of the object during the collision is equal to the integral of the total force acting on that object during this time. This integral is usually called the impulse delivered by the force. We can use this result to define the average force acting on the object during the collision to be equal to the change in momentum of the object divided by the duration of the collision. This result simply reflects the differential form of Newton's second law that we used to get started. We will examine this result in more detail on the next slide. We've just determined that the change in momentum of an object during a collision is equal to the product of the average force acting on that object and the time over which it acts. Therefore, we can achieve the same change in momentum by having a large force acting for a short time as we can having a small force acting for a long time. We will now do an example to illustrate this observation. Here we see a one kilogram ball released from rest from an initial height of one meter above the floor. It bounces back to half its original height. If we assume the ball is in contact with the floor for a time of 10 milliseconds, what is the average force on the ball during the collision? To determine the average force acting during the collision, we need to first determine the change in the momentum of the ball. We can use the conservation of energy during the ball's initial free fall to determine the ball's velocity just before it hits the floor and we find that it is proportional to the square root of the height from which it was released. Putting in the numbers, we obtain a speed of 4.43 meters per second. Note that the initial velocity of the ball is taken to be negative since it is moving downward. We can also use energy conservation to determine that for the ball to rebound to a height of a half a meter, it must have had a speed of 3.13 meters per second immediately after it left the floor. The change in the momentum of the ball during the collision is therefore equal to 7.56 kilogram meters per second. We can now determine the average force acting during the collision by dividing this change in momentum by the duration of the collision to obtain the value of 756 newtons. We will now repeat the exact same experiment with a harder ball that flexes less and consequently spends less time in contact with the floor. If, for example, the time of the collision is reduced by a factor of 10, the average force on the ball must be increased by the same factor of 10 to keep the change in momentum the same. In other words, the average force on the ball during such a collision would be 7,560 newtons. We've seen that often the simplest description of collisions occurs in a reference frame in which the center of mass of the colliding objects is at rest. We will now extend this approach to the discussion of the kinetic energy of a system of particles. Consider a simple system made up of two point particles of mass m1 and m2 connected by a massless rod. If we throw this object in our laboratory reference frame, we know it will tumble in some complicated way, but we also know that the center of mass will move in a very simple way, namely that the center of mass will behave as though it were a point particle having the total mass of the object. At any instant, the kinetic energy of the system is equal to the sum of the kinetic energies of the two particles.
We can express the velocity of an object in the lab frame as the vector sum of the velocity of the object in the center of mass reference frame plus the velocity of the center of mass in the lab reference frame. When we make this sum, we see that the total energy of the system as viewed in the lab frame can be written as the sum of just two terms. The first term is the sum of the kinetic energies of the objects as viewed in the center of mass frame. And the second term is the kinetic energy of the center of mass as viewed in the lab reference frame. The remaining terms involve the total momentum in the center of mass reference frame, which by definition is always zero. The result we derived on the previous slide is completely general. The total kinetic energy of any system of objects as viewed by an observer is simply equal to the total kinetic energy of the objects as viewed in the center of mass reference frame, often called the relative kinetic energy, plus the total kinetic energy of the center of mass in the observer's reference frame, often called the center of mass kinetic energy. This result has two profound implications. First of all, the total kinetic energy of a system of particles will, in general, have two distinct components. This result will become central to our discussion of rotations in the next pre-lecture. Second, we see that the kinetic energy of a system of particles does depend on the reference frame of the observer. In other words, the relative kinetic energy will be the same for all observers but the center of mass kinetic energy will be different for different observers since it will depend on the speed of the center of mass in the frame of the observer. We conclude with a brief discussion of the main points of this pre-lecture. First, we determine that the rate at which two objects approach each other before an elastic collision is the same as the rate at which they separate afterward. This result follows from the observation that in the center of mass frame, the speed of each object after the collision is the same as it was before the collision, and that the relative velocity, that is, the difference in the velocity vectors at any time between any two objects, is the same in all inertial reference frames. Second, we define the impulse as the integral of the force over the time of a collision, and then use Newton's second law to determine that the impulse delivered by a force to an object is equal to the change in momentum of that object. Third, we determine that the kinetic energy of a system of particles, defined as the sum of the kinetic energies of the particles in the system, is equal to the kinetic energy of the particles relative to the center of mass, a term that is the same in all reference frames, plus the energy of the center of mass, a term that does depend on the reference frame of the observer.